You're listening to a download from BBC Radio 4. I'm Alex Kratoski, and this is The Digital Human. Today, we're looking at the future of our cities in urban. We're in a, we're in a very comfortable air-conditioned environment. I know it's hot as hell outside, so <laughs> tell me a little bit about where we are. We are at the gateway to Mazdar City. We're standing outside the PRT, or Personal Rapid Transit uh, Station. We're looking at a pod car. It looks a bit Jetsons-like. As you mentioned, it is hot, and hell is a technical term, but it's about 40 degrees today in Abu Dhabi, probably. As we arrived, and I was reading up on Mazdar City, I just thought, oh my god, we're going into the future. Yes, but, but actually we brought it back to the present. So you can come, you can see the future right now. Make sure that one get that one gets in. I want that one to be on the radio. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, well let's let's go. Let's get in. Let's go. I asked the question: When you look at these kind of top-down smart city infrastructures, how much do they actually enable people to feel that they themselves own the city and make decisions about the city? A utopia is not something you can build for someone else, you know, without input from the people who are going to live in those places about what it is their dreams are and their hopes are and what it is they hope to achieve in this environment. You can never build it properly. At current rates, by the end of this program, another 3,000 people from across the globe will have moved to live in cities. But what will those cities look like? A utopia of glass and steel or a vast global favela? I'm Alex Kratoski, and this is The Digital Human. Follow us on Twitter with the hashtag DigiHuman. We have been urbanizing effectively at an exponential rate for the last uh, couple of hundred years. Jeffrey West from the Santa Fe Institute. Most of the major challenges we face in society, everything from uh, global warming and climate change to uh, questions of health, pollution, disease, all are driven by the fact that the majority of people are now beginning to live in cities. But uh, on the other hand, cities are also the origin of their solution because they attract the smart people and in particular the kind of buzz and interaction then leads to innovation, ideas, wealth creation and so on. Uh, And with the impending threat of global sustainability, we need to ask the question whether there is a science of cities in order to address many of these issues. Jeffrey West is pursuing one kind of science of cities. But on the ground, urban planners are cracking on with the modern tools of the trade, digital technology. So my name is Elaine Doody, and I lead the Smart Cities Consulting Team at Arup. Um, Arup is a multidisciplinary consultancy, and we work with cities, um, industry, and government on smart city projects. When I think of smart, I think you know of, of IQ or getting an A plus or or an A star. Is that the idea behind it? Are you actually creating a city that is that is ultimately better? Smart cities is a funny term. It, it's a useful term in that it's kind of shorthand for you know, something about IT and cities. But it's not a useful term in that it is open to misunderstanding and elaboration. So I like to think of it as smart cities is basically the application of technology to cities to make great places, to, you know, enable growth and to do make more sustainable cities. The poster child of the future of cities is a small, sustainable development in the middle of the desert in Abu Dhabi. Mazdar City is a utopian vision of efficiency, funded personally by the Emir. Iyad Rahwan is from the Mazdar Institute of Technology. He specializes in social computing and artificial intelligence. Now, when you're planning a city to be smart from the start, what are you aiming for? To me, a smart city is, uh, you know, just like what we consider as a smart person. A smart person is a person who is quite perceptive, so someone who can understand uh, their environment and themselves better, 
And I think uh, likewise, a smart city is a city that is able to sense its own state. Where, where is the congestion? What is the cause of the congestion? A smart person is a person who can take rational action to improve their well-being. Um, given, given their environment, then um, a smart city is one that can react uh, intelligently via policy, via technology, via you know, dynamic tools, whatever it is, uh, but, but do so intelligently in, in order to make its citizens healthier, uh, happier, more productive, and so on. In a climate like Abu Dhabi, where temperatures can regularly soar to over 40 degrees and where there's a constant reminder of declining natural resources, the city must be smart to survive. Stephen Severin is my guide through Mazdar City in the electric driverless car of the future. There's two aspects to the future of energy. One is how we, how we produce it. The second is how we consume it. And this, uh, a lot of what we're doing at Mazdar City is focused on how we consume it. And now we're here so we can get out. We'll keep talking a bit. Where are we going next? Let's go outdoors. Uh, to me, this is one of the most important aspects of our, our communities. Uh, we're standing outside right now. It is significantly cooler where we're standing than it is on the outside. Undoubtedly. Well, we're definitely shaded. And I suppose that's helpful for getting people outside of the air-conditioned environment, which I can imagine has a real toll on your, on your sustainable community. Yes. Most of our philosophy was, how did people live for thousands of years before there was air conditioning, and how can we in- integrate those techniques into our buildings? And we think this is really one of the key aspects of our community, is a walkable lifestyle and, and a place where people have the opportunity to get outside of their own environment and see their neighbors. You can think of it as going in two directions. So in one, in one direction, a smart city can sense behavior at f- much finer grained level. If you have sensors that track pollution or congestion, uh, likewise, maybe you can use uh, the uh, data from uh, mobile phones to track people's movements. So you have a, a, an increased ability to sense what is going on. At the same time, you also have a better ability to affect change, right? So if everybody's carrying a mobile phone with them and they're happy to install apps that uh, maybe, say, advise them about the best routes to take or the least carbon emitting then you can also affect behavior. When people talk about smart cities, they talk about the thing that immediately comes to your mind is smart infrastructure. But um, I think it's very important to also look at the human factor because if people don't react in the way that you anticipate, then obviously the behavior, um, you may not achieve the outcome that you expect. My name is Amira Al-Dahmani, and I st- I'm doing my engineering systems management master's in the Mazdar Institute. The heart of Mazdar is its Institute of Technology, and students like Amira are pretty much the only people living there at the moment. Their apartments have sustainable technologies that we would normally associate with our places of work rather than our homes. So the water here in my apartment works with sensors. Now, when I put my hand... I have water, and also the electricity works with the sensors. So if I move from the sitting room to the bedroom, then the power will go off. At the beginning, it was like awkward, but then you got used to it. And now I feel like it's not hard to save energy. We're going to do my favorite uh, field test here. So this is the water tower. No, no, this is not the water tower. This is actually a wind tower. Um, oh, wow. This is amazing. This is, this is it's kind of like outside um, air conditioning. Traditionally, in, air, in Arab homes, you have a wind tower that takes the, cool, takes the cool air from outside down and forces the hot air from inside the house back up. We have added a little technology to this and miss the air as it comes down to make it even cooler. So you know today, today is almost a wind-free day. But right now, you can feel it's significantly cooler because of the misting and the breeze coming down from up top. The tower also serves another purpose. So the wind tower has LED lights that uh, at night, if you consume more energy than the average, the lights turn to red color. And uh, if the consumption is less than the average, then the lights turn to a blue color. So when I see the wind tower turn to a red color, it gives me this feeling that I, I maybe I should consume less So, yeah, I think it influenced everyone here. Fundamentally, Mazdar City is a test bed 
Its purpose is to trial new technologies in real-life situations. But crucially, that's not just for hardware like solar panels and energy consumption sensors. They're also experimenting with social systems that influence how people live their lives. In the UK, we call this nudge. At the moment, you've got a lot of control because it's a small population. But once you get beyond a certain number of people, you're not going to have nearly as much control over how people use the space or where they go in the space, where they congregate. Or do you feel that you have created architecturally and and also in terms of the philosophy, do you feel that you will have created something where people will flock to the places that you want them to flock to. Well, to be able to predict how people will use Mass Air City or to be able to predict what technologies are going to affect how they use Mass Air City 5, 10, 15, 25 years from now, I think is a little crazy to say. I would sit here and tell you that right now. People will see Mass Air City as their own. When they come live here, we want them to be, be a part of it and to use it how they use it. So if they create community spaces inside their buildings, out, you know, outside their buildings in the, in the open space there... We need that. At the moment, you've got approximately 200 people, most of whom are the students or staff who are working at the Institute. And I'm also curious about other elements of of city life. So, for example, uh, if you think about key workers, you think about teachers, you think about nurses, you think about hospitals, what types of um, facilities or what types of incentives are you using to bring those types of, of people to Mazdar City? Well, absolutely. We're going to need to have a full range of services for the people who live here, and that includes schools. We're also, and the next phase is obviously residential. A city is not uh, an institute, and uh, some commercial buildings are not a city. People need to live here. And so the next phase of Mass Air City, and I hope you'll see some uh, announcements very soon about how we're going to introduce a much larger residential component to Mass Air City. There was a, I was just literally a couple of weeks ago in Australia, and I was reading the local paper, and, and there was a, um, a group of artists who felt that they should be key workers as well, who felt that they create, you know, this space for people to share and collaborate and all of that kind of thing. Are there going to be any facilities for artists? Well, I think we'd certainly be open to that. That's not not in the immediate plans, uh, but I think that it's certainly an, an idea that we'd be a little interested in hearing more about. Mazdar has no soul. It's like a movie set or an out-of-town shopping center. I could not imagine living there. But that, perhaps, is because I like disruption. I'm a city slicker. I've lived in metropolises all my life. And one of the things that I most enjoy is how certain elements of society find the cracks in a system and then exploit them, usually for either an artistic or political effect. Mazdar City is an example of a top-down approach to urban planning. It is definitely not to everyone's taste. Certainly not to place hacker Bradley Garrett's. The idea of building a city from scratch in order to, you know, be a smart city um, is nothing new. You know, you can look back to St. Petersburg, where they, they built a city from nothing, and there was a sense that they were going to build a perfect city from the ground up. In a sense, it worked, you know. Two decades later, there were there were 100,000 people in the city. However, there's a, a, an endless poetry and literature about how stale the city was, how there was no life in it, how there was no creativity there. Eventually, it found that. But I don't think that's something that you can create. It's something that has to happen. The way that cities actually are supposed to develop is it's about... It's about an unfolding event, an accumulation of flows and connections that begin to accrete. The problem with that whole smart city narrative, in in my mind, is that it's only about one particular facet of what constitutes the city. Making things more ecologically sustainable, perhaps, or making transportation more efficient. But basically, it always comes down to economics. The architect and the urban planners efficient vision of what a city should be is often a prison for the inhabitants of the city. I think Mazdar is a really a really interesting example. If you've got a public transportation system and you've got very strict boundaries on the city, these walls that are blocking out the dust storm, and there are no cars in the city to get you around. I know this is contested now, but potentially there will be. That seems a lot like a prison to me. <laughs> We're standing on London Bridge in the shadow of the Shard, which we climbed. And very few people know that this bridge is actually hollow. And we found that giant hollow cavity 
we, uh, we got about 80 people down there. We threw a massive party inside the bridge. <laughs> Bradley's become almost notorious for his exploits as an urban explorer, which he recently chronicled in a book, Explore Everything, Place Hacking the City. But he's more than just a rabble rouser. Dr. Garrett is a researcher in the Department for Geography and the Environment at the University of Oxford. So we're, we're just at the base of the walkie-talkie building, or the pint glass, and um, these buildings are always surrounded by hoardings and CCTV cameras and security guards, and, you know, they, they look totally inaccessible. They're not. There's, there's loopholes in the security all over the place. So, you know, rather than seeing this as an inaccessible site, you can just choose to see this as a totally accessible site. And I think that there's, psychologically, um, there's something quite beneficial about seeing the city as a realm for opportunity rather than a realm of exclusion. Why is it that, that we're encouraged and, uh, to explore the wilderness? And that's, that's even celebrated. Um, but when we're in an urban environment, we're disciplined for doing the same thing. It really doesn't make any sense. If we want to live in cities where creative and interesting things are happening, there's a, little, there's a little price tag to that. You know, some walls are going to get painted, some skateboarders are going to wax a curb, some urban explorers are going to trigger a police response. I'd, I'd rather have that and, and pay for a little bit of that than to live into, in a completely sterile city where nothing interesting is happening and it's not costing anyone any money. What would be like a um, sort of gross misconduct in Mazdar City? You know, what would what would be kind of breaking the rules? Uh, we do not turn off people's showers after three minutes. There's no button that automatically turns it off. Uh, we do, uh, you know, in certain spaces here, we set the there's limits on how low you can turn the air conditioning. But we are there's not a gross misconduct penalty. You don't get thrown out of your you don't get thrown out of your apartment if you accidentally fall asleep with the TV on. And it stays on all night. You get, two or three ni- you get two or three nights before we throw you out. <laughs> no, Stephen, that's not what I meant. I can imagine that hanging laundry out to dry over one of the immaculate balconies that overlooks Mazdar Central Square wouldn't be very welcome. But of course, not everyone could just up sticks and move to a brand new city wherever it was being built, nor would we necessarily want to. We have friends, communities, messy spaces that we feel ownership of. We have networks. So, if new smart cities are all about sustainability, what about the old smart cities that are being retrofitted with new technologies? For Lane Duty of Arup, it's about making life in the city more efficient. Actually, the more interesting work around smart cities is about how do you use technology in existing cities to enable people to do the things they want to do. So in London, that's a really interesting problem because you've got, or or opportunity rather, um, because you've got all the existing relationships and people and things happening in London. And then how do you allow technology to help those people get where they want to go quicker or do what they want to do more quickly? A really a good example in London in particular is all the data that Transport for London has made available um, on buses, for example. And so now, instead of waiting at the bus stop for a bus that may never come, you can find out from the get-go that the bus isn't coming or that the bus is coming in two minutes. The city, as we know it now, is built for flow. You know, things need to move. Goods need to move, money needs to move, people need to move. You know, someone's going to sit down right here in the middle of the pavement. My God, what would we do? The modern city is terrified of stasis. Or of strangers sitting at a bus stop with nothing to do, accidentally striking up a conversation with one another. What about the things that interrupt your daily life and make it less efficient, but more interpersonally rich? A vibrant city... It's going to be a difficult city to negotiate, I think. We can, we can think back to uh, Napoleon III, to think about this notion of sort of making the city more, more efficient for, for mobility and flow. When he had his architect, uh, Baron Hausmann, go into Paris and just bulldoze vast swaths of the city. The, the Place du Carousel gets completely annihilated, a place that was, you know, incredibly vibrant. It was full of of, uh, street performers and pickpockets and prostitutes. And it's overwritten with 
broad boulevards that will facilitate the movement of troops so that they can quickly suppress any public dissent. And the city that was built was immensely more boring than the city that existed. Is there not an argument, though, for, for a messy space that isn't optimized, that in some ways just allows us to be... Um, Yes, definitely. And I I think those spaces will continue to exist. There's definitely a role for efficiency. I mean, I think most people prefer, you know, to have their bins collected and they prefer to have clean streets and they prefer to have, you know, the bus come when it says it's going to come and those kinds of things. So the efficiency thing, I think, is important. But there's also the idea that you don't need to also then super optimise. If you look at the history of urban design, it has always been about maximizing the benefit for the citizens. And you look even at the, at the post-war developments in the 1960s and, and the, the town planners, the urban planners at that time really did think that they were building cities with concrete that was going to change the world. And so are you not doing the same thing with technology as, as these idealists, as these urban planners were doing with their concrete or, or their new ways of thinking? I mean, I hope not. But the, yeah, certainly success Successive waves of urban design and urban planning have had their utopias. But we need to recognise that unintended consequences can happen. The exciting thing about the smart technologies are that they don't involve necessarily lots of physical development. So this is something that, that actually does concern me a little bit. Usman Hack is a London-based architect, artist, and technologist. A lot of the kind of marketing and the rhetoric around smart cities, things about, you know, efficiency and convenience and security, actually echoes very closely the kind of language that was used in the 50s and 60s, especially around the introduction of things like highways and high-rises. Now, of course, now we, we can see that they had a lot of unforeseen economic and social and even environmental and health impacts. Um, And I suppose that my argument would be that a lot of the sort of technological infrastructure that's being put in place for these sort of smart city um, initiatives is about trying to bring order to chaos, make things more efficient, make trains meet buses, meet pedestrians and and whatnot. And actually what happens is that you have this sort of knock-on consequence of of not asking the right questions, which might be uh, completely unrelated in the environmental or social field. There is this kind of implicit expectation that the more you measure, the better your knowledge is. And I would actually argue that the more you measure, the less you know about who measured, why they measured, where they measured, when they measured, whether this is sort of air quality data or whether it's energy data. I don't think necessarily having more information necessarily leads to better decision making. Jeffrey West is a physicist, and as someone who studied the maths of cities, he doesn't actually believe that throwing data at it solves the problem. Urban planning and the politics surrounding it tend to be dominated by the infrastructure. You know, cities are seen in terms of their physicality. Um, I think the paradigm uh, in terms of the urban scene in the 21st century is beginning to evolve around this idea of having sensors everywhere that sense everything and and uh, somehow that is enough to determine uh, the optimization of a city. Data is always good, I believe. I'm a great fan of data and I'm a great fan of big data, but I'm not a great fan of mindless use of big data. And um, I'm quite concerned that a uh, there's been this kind of somewhat hyperbolic rush to embrace the use of data everywhere, that we get as much data as we can. We take great big shovels and we shovel it into computers and out of those computers come solutions to all our problems. All of these issues that we are dealing with, everything from transport, energy, socioeconomic well-being of citizens, health, all of these are interconnected. Each one is a complex system. Each one is an adaptive, evolving system. And they adapt and evolve by continuous interaction among themselves and as a totality of a system. So uh, at the risk of only focusing on one piece and using data on just one piece of the system runs the risk of serious unintended consequences. (laughs) 
Are we looking in the wrong place for the smartness that our cities need? If you have a process of, of sort of, of actually empowering people to measure things themselves, that actually seems to me to result in smarter decision making. And so the point is that the smartness is not in an infrastructure. It's actually in the, in the kind of connections between people and between people in their spaces, if you see it. I mean, how you actually get those, those two woven together actually is, is, is where the smartness comes. When you talk about this, there is an interesting blur between those systems that are necessary to keep um, an organism like a city in operation and then the organisms of, of the city dwellers. Would you say that we're talking about developing smart cities or smart city dwellers? I think smart citizens will develop themselves as they their expectations for information and their expectations for how they connect with each other and with different institutions is already changing things. So I think people themselves, once they get the tools, will, will change the city. We need a top-down and a bottom-up approach. So the bottom-up approach is the citizens, but we also need the top-down because we need the leaders to create the space for these things to happen. But I think people will always subvert things. I hope so, anyway. Cities are organisms. They're not devices. Devices are locked down. Cities are open and free. I have an iPhone, and I love it. However, I'm, I'm completely aware of the fact that if I want it to do something that an app not authorized by Apple doesn't do, the phone won't do that. And if you build a city in the same way, so that it has very particular functions that work quite well together, but there's no way to hack or change those functions, it's not going to have the kind of efficiency that they want it to because people are going to rebel against it in various ways. I think there's somewhere in the middle where we can meet, where there's a little bit of opportunity for chaos and spontaneity, and then a little bit of help from the top down to make things slightly more efficient. And if we can meet somewhere in the middle, it's that space of negotiation where we're actually going to find the city that we're looking for. At the one end, we have smart cities with agendas to keep the infrastructure as controlled and as efficient as it possibly can be. On the other, we have human networks that want to express themselves through their environments and they need the freedom to do that. We're marching steadily towards the city of the future. They'll deliver smart technologies that help everyone in almost invisible ways to get on with their lives. Who is the smart city for? The number cruncher? Or the place hacker? Or both? You've been listening to The Digital Human. You can find this and all of the programs from the previous series on the BBC's website, or you can visit thedigitalhuman.tumblr.com for even more background information, plus a glimpse behind the scenes. We'll be back next week. Bye for now. Bye for now.